Okay, so we have uh, covered uh, the last uh, modeling paradigm that I uh, wanted to cover in this chapter. So next uh, we can wrap up uh, this uh, chapter. I would like to do this by first of all comparing the different models with respect to certain objectives. So which objectives can we use in order to compare these different models? Well, we can look at the expressiveness that means uh, we can check how easy it is to, to actually uh, model certain systems and uh, how compact these models could be. Uh, we can also evaluate these different models with respect to their analyzability. Uh, that means uh, can we actually figure out, for example, how large the buffer sizes should be, can we figure out how long a certain execution would last, and, and all these things need to be analyzed and uh, the analyzability would uh, be one uh, result of this analysis. And then we can look at the implementation efficiency. This means that, for example, uh, we have to figure out whether we need large buffers, wh whether we uh, could just uh, be happy with small buffers, uh, whether we need uh, fast processes, etc. So that is something that we can consider during the analysis of the implementation efficiency. So in this context, we have already seen charts, and in particular this one. Uh, this is a chart that uh, compares uh, the expressiveness of various data flow models, and we see that uh, for CAN process networks, uh, we are Turing complete, uh, whereas for cyclostatic data flow, for synchronous data flow, and for homogeneous uh, synchronous data flow, uh, we are not Turing complete. So these are the things that uh, can be done if we compare uh, the power of the different models. Also, uh, comparing uh, the mechanisms that we have available for describing processes or threats, uh, we can use various uh, criteria. So, for example, we can check uh, uh, the uh, variability with respect to the number of threats or processes. So, are they static or are they dynamic? In general, uh, they are static for those languages where we don't, uh, where we model hardware, and where we are not assuming that we add or delete uh, hardware dynamically. Second uh, a way of comparing uh, uh, the way in which we can use processes is to look at the way that we are, uh, can use nesting. Uh, in some languages, it's feasible to uh, nest uh, process declarations. In others, all these processes are essentially declared at the same level. Furthermore, there can be different ways of uh, uh, starting or creating these processes. This can be done through elaboration in the source code. That's the case for ADA. Uh, we can have explicit forks and joins. That's what we are able to do with Unix. And then we can have explicit process creation calls. And this is supported uh, for many of the libraries that could be used together with imperative languages. So using uh, these different criteria, we can, for example, argue uh, that uh, state charts uh, comprises a static number of processes because it's supposed to also model hardware. Uh, it allows us to have a nested declaration of processes, and process creation is uh, through elaboration in the source code. We are not explicitly indicating at what time processes are uh, started or created. Uh, these different criteria can be used whenever we compare the different languages like uh, state charts or VHDL. In this table we also have some other entries that we didn't cover, but we also have SDL, Petrinets, Java there, and some other hardware description languages together with ADAR. And if we use the different criteria that we uh, came up with uh, at the very beginning of this uh, chapter, we can see that there is no language uh, that uh, meets all these criteria, and that therefore we usually have to live with uh, compromises. So how do we live with uh, compromises? Well, if we have to live with compromises, we typically have to use uh, mixed approaches. That means uh, that we have, a num have to use a number of models of computation. So for example, at a very high level, we could start uh, with uh, some technique for capturing the initial requirements. 
uh, using UML, using a variant of uh, UML that is uh, specialized for real-time systems. And then there are techniques uh, for uh, deriving from uh, uh, UML uh, some implementation information for, let's say, uh, SDL or for Java. And then from SDL, it would uh, be feasible to generate VHDL. And from VHDL, we can generate the netlist and finally hardware. And if we look more at the software track, uh, we can generate C programs from SDL and uh, generate assembly language and binary programs uh, from these uh, C programs. And for Java, we can do some similar thing. So that means we have uh, to combine these different models of computation. Now this means that we need transformations between these different models and indeed transformations between the different models are possible. There are many cases where these models are transformed into sequential code, so for many of the models we are generating sequential code. Uh, also, uh, restricted petri nets and SDF are very similar, so therefore uh, we can transform one model into the other. And it has also been shown, and we will see this in one of the later chapters, uh, that we can uh, uh, translate uh, VHDL into C and vice versa with certain restrictions. So that might lead to the question, well, why do we actually use all these models of computation? Well, I think uh, it has something to do with uh, uh, the ease with which we are actually specifying systems, because using one model uh, makes the specification much easier and much less error-prone than some other model. And therefore, even though it's possible to transform one model into the other, it may be very useful to start uh, with uh, one of of these. If we do uh, translate from one model to the other, we have to make sure that uh, we actually stay semantically correct. Uh, so therefore, these transformations should be based on precise descriptions of the semantics. And there are papers on the slide. You find, for example, one referen to reference to such a paper. And for an advanced course on cyber physical system design, we could, uh, for example, try to cover this uh, rather formal aspect. Now, mixing models of computation is also feasible with one of the with some of the modeling environments that are available. One of them is, for example, the Ptolemy environment that is available from UC Berkeley. Uh, the Ptolemy environment allows you to have a uh, uh, allows you to simulate with uh, a mixed set of uh, models. This environment can be uh, freely downloaded uh, from this website, but it could also be used directly uh, from the web. There is a certain set of uh, examples uh, for these different models of computation that can be tried out. In order to demonstrate what can be done, I'd like uh, to uh, point to Newton's Cradle, which is this little toy that you might have seen somewhere in a gift shop. And I'd like to demonstrate how this can be uh, simulated with Ptolemy. So over here we see this uh, model that uh, comes uh, with the Ptolemy environment. So over here you see the Ptolemy website from which I just downloaded uh, this little uh, simulation there. And uh, we can start the simulation and then we should see certain windows. And in these windows we can see the uh, behavior uh, of the little balls there. We can see for a system that contains three balls that the center ball always stays at the same place and that uh, the uh, other uh, two balls, they are swinging to one side uh, when uh, the third ball is uh, attached to, to the center ball. And uh, then this uh, uh, ball up here uh, gets uh, 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 comes pretty close to the center ball. And this uh, red ball is then uh, going to the opposite side. So we see that uh, at any point in time, uh, two of the uh, uh, balls are uh, immediately next to each other, whereas the third one, third one will swing to one of the sides. Uh, 
And down here you see the different uh, velocities. You see that uh, there is a velocity which, which is increasing there and then suddenly uh, this red ball is uh, hitting the center ball and the velocity drops uh, to zero. As a result of that the velocity of this other ball gets to its maximum. It uh, will become negative and uh, uh, then uh, will uh, uh, get back to zero when it hits this, the center ball again. So we see that in this case we see a system that uh, to some extent is uh, described by partial differential equations. Whenever these balls are swinging we are describing the system uh, with partial differential equations. Uh, but we have some kind of uh, modal partial differential equations in that uh, when this red ball is attached to the blue ball it behaves differently from the situation when it is actually swinging. So we have certain times during which uh, a, a certain set of partial differential equations is applying and other times during which other equations are applying. So these uh, kind of mixed systems can be described in uh, one simulation system and there are many more examples that can be used there from the Ptolemy website. So uh, looking back at our uh, table we can identify which of the models are actually available together with the Ptolemy environment. We see that there is absolutely no support for the early design phases. That's not the target of the Ptolemy environment. Then we see that for communicating finite state machines we do have a uh, modeling environment there. Also we have some support for synchronous languages. We have uh, comprehensive support for, for data flow. There we have more models than were covered in my course. Uh, for distributed, uh, for discrete events, we have uh, support both for the case of shared memory and for distributed systems. And for the von Neumann model, we see that there is support for CSP. And then, in addition, there is support for some other models of computation. The same type of mixing is possible with uh, UML, with the Unified Modeling uh, uh, Language. There we see, if we look at this table, that the support is mainly constrained uh, 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 towards the more early phases. We see that we have support for uh, undefined components here. We have support for state diagrams. We have support for data flow. And uh, with respect to petri nets, uh, we have a variant called activity charts, but there is no support over here. So we see that in practice it does actually help to have this table because in this way we can uh, compare uh, the uh, modeling power of uh, the uh, different environments that allow us to mix and match different models of computation. In the context of uh, UML, we nevertheless have to raise the question whether it's really appropriate to use UML uh, for real time. Because initially, uh, quite a number of features were missing there. It was not possible to partition software into tasks and processes. It was not, not possible to specify timing and the specification of hardware components was also not possible. So therefore, there were some projects that uh, tried to exploit the fact that for UML you can have uh, profiles that extend UML into a certain direction. And you can see from this list that there was uh, a quite uh, long list of uh, uh, projects, there are even more than, than are on this uh, slide, that try to extend UML in the direction needed for real-time and embedded systems. So as an example, I'd like uh, to point to, to this particular case where we see an activity diagram uh, which is uh, extended by an annotation, an annotation that provides some information about uh, the expected uh, delay there. The problem, however, is that uh, these uh, profiles may be incompatible. So if you would like, for example, to use this uh, scalab uh, scalability uh, 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 profile together with uh, the system C profile, you will have to check whether this really works in this uh, combination. Uh, coming towards the end of this chapter, I would also like uh, to cover one final topic. 
and that is the topic of modeling levels. Uh, in general, when we model a complex system, we can do this at uh, various levels, and you see a number of levels indicated on the slide. Now, the levels between which we uh, distinguish really depends uh, to some extent on the taste, on the environment, on the company, on the product area, etc. So, therefore, I can only provide you with an example of uh, the levels that could be used. So, in this example, we are starting at the so-called uh, system level. We will see in a minute what I mean by system level. There is the so-called algorithm level, and I will also go into the details here. We can talk about the processor memory switch level, or PMS level, where uh, we describe a system in terms of the processors, memories, and switches which are used there. There is, at a lower level of detail, uh, the uh, so-called instruction set level, and I will talk about that level as well. Many people these days talk about tran transaction level modeling, uh, where we are just uh, referring to memory reads and writes as transactions. We are not actually considering the uh, cycles that are involved there. We can talk about uh, the register transfer level. I will give an example there as well. And uh, going uh, even more into detail, we can talk about uh, the different gates, the AND and OR gates, and we can talk about the layout level, which means that we're talking about rectangles and possibly other shapes uh, that are used in the integrated uh, circuits. In general, uh, the level that we are choosing uh, is a compromise between uh, the accuracy that we are interested in and the simulation speed or the simulation time that we can afford. And we also always have to find a good uh, compromise. So looking at the system level, I'd like to try uh, to define the term system level, which indeed is rather difficult. Because the term system level is not really clearly defined, many people talk about different things when they talk about the system level. Here in this context, in the context of this uh, course, I'd like uh, uh, to understand the system level uh, as uh, the level at which we are modeling the entire cyber physical uh, system. Uh, that means including all the mechanical and other physical parts, including all the physical environment. And that means in many of the cases we do need partial differential equations to really uh, model at the system level. So that means uh, in order to model mechanics and information uh, processing, uh, we uh, might uh, face the difficulty of finding an appropriate uh, modeling environment there. We might uh, face difficulties with finding appropriate simulators. But nevertheless, there are certain versions of uh, simulators available that provide us with this capability. For VHDL, there is an extension called VHDL AMS. Uh, it's feasible to model at this level in MATLAB and uh, also for uh, system C there is a facility to integrate partial differential equations. In general, it's a challenge to uh, model the information processing systems in such an environment so that from the specifications we can also synthesize systems because at this level much of the emphasis is actually on simulations. Also looking at the details of the algorithm uh, level, I'd like uh, uh, to demonstrate what I mean by algorithmic level. Uh, in this case, we are simulating the algorithms which are to be used in the cyber-physical systems. In that case, it's very important that we are not including any reference uh, to processes or instruction sets. As an example, I'd like to point to this little piece of code where uh, we have a couple of uh, nested loops. That could be a typical example. In this case, this is actually uh, an example demonstrating motion estimation. Uh, if we model at the algorithmic level, we might be using data types at a higher precision than what we are using in the final implementation. We might even use uh, floating point uh, data types. We might be using 32-bit uh, integers, whereas in the final implementation we might be using uh, integers with a lower bit length. 
if we are modeling at this level so that uh, every uh, bit uh, in our algorithm actually corresponds to one bit in the final implementation, then we are calling this model to be bit true. That means that we are able to capture all the effects that are resulting from a limited word length of uh, uh, our uh, uh, representation of numbers. Um, in this case, we are using a single process or a sets of uh, cooperating processes. Going uh, further down uh, the uh, different modeling levels, I'd like to look also at the instruction set architecture level or the ISA level. In this case, we assume that the algorithms are already compiled for a certain instruction set. Uh, this allows us to count the number of executed instructions. Uh, with respect to the simulations, uh, we can distinguish between different approaches. We could just uh, simulate the effect of these instructions. In particular, we could uh, model at the so-called instruction, uh, uh, we could uh, use uh, transaction level modeling there, which means that uh, considering the effects of the instructions, we would just model read and write operations as one operation and not look at the cycle counts there. But uh, we could also use another variant of uh, simulations at the instruction set architecture level. We could be using cycle through simulations, which means that uh, we are simulating each and every cycle so that uh, after the uh, simulation has terminated, we know exactly how many cycles we needed. And again, uh, we can use the term bit through simulations because in this case uh, it also matters whether we simulate each and every bit uh, that we have there in the final architecture or whether we use some abstraction there. Going down uh, towards uh, more detailed uh, levels, we can look at the register transfer level uh, where we model components that we find at the register transfer level, including arithmetic uh, logic units or so-called ALUs. We would find their registers, memories, multiplexes and decoders. And this would be a little schematic that uh, demonstrates some memories there, some registers, some, some maxes. So this is how we uh, model at the register transfer level or more precisely uh, at the structural view of the register transfer level. At this level models are always uh, cycled through and usually they are also bit through so that in this uh, way we have a very detailed uh, modeling capability for our final system. However simulation is certainly slower than at the higher levels. At this level, uh, we have enough uh, uh, detail provided in the model so that uh, synthesis is typically feasible. Uh, typically, it's not a problem to synthesize the different components in such a description uh, down to the very detailed level. So, for example, we can generate uh, the patterns that are required for, for FPGAs or the patterns that are required for designing a, a application-specific integrated circuit. So what's the uh, bottom of the line at the end of this uh, chapter? Uh, we have seen that uh, the prevailing technique for writing embedded applications is uh, still the use of von Neumann languages. However, the use of uh, von Neumann languages in software design has some inherent uh, problems, some problems that are resulting from the use of from Neumann languages and that are not resulting from the applications or design constraints. So in a way, these are artificial problems. Uh, however, if we look around for some uh, options, we will uh, find that there are other ways of uh, specifying a system. However, there is uh, no so-called silver bullet. There is no ideal modeling technique that will solve all the problems. Uh, the choice between the different uh, models uh, that we can use, the different modeling techniques that we can use, really depends on the application and we might uh, have uh, to use uh, a mix of different models. In many cases, uh, we have to check whether from the non-imperative models uh, code generation is actually available. Are we able to generate the necessary code, for example, uh, from SDF models or not? 
Also, we uh, see, uh, in spe especially if we look at the last slides, uh, there, there is a trade-off uh, between uh, the power of a modeling technique and uh, its uh, analyzability. Uh, in particular, if we look at uh, Khan process networks, we see that there is a, a very powerful modeling technique, but it's very difficult to analyze. Uh, so we see that there is a need to combine different modeling techniques and uh, I think as a kind of bottom line I would like to recommend that in any case you should uh, open your eyes, you should think about the most appropriate modeling technique and you should not start too early with just writing some sequential code because uh, it could mean that you're missing uh, mi uh, uh, optimization potential there and uh, that you uh, end up in a system that uh, is in danger of uh, deadlocks where this could have been avoided. Uh, it could happen that in the end you will have to use imperative models but uh, nevertheless it's very useful uh, to be aware of the options. So for example if you are aware of the general properties of Khan process networks you can exploit the benefits of Khan process networks even in those cases where uh, you have to use uh, sequential programming languages. So to summarize uh, this uh, last uh, lecture uh, for chapter 2 of the companion textbook, I'd like uh, to point again to the fact that we have covered imperative von Neumann models. We have seen some problems that are resulting from the access to shared resources and that as a result we are running the risk of having a deadlock. Uh, we have seen that uh, communication primitives can be either built into these languages or we can use libraries there. And uh, as far as the libraries are concerned, we will have some additional information uh, in this uh, context in Chapter 4. And then I have uh, wrapped up this uh, chapter by comparing the different models. We saw the trade off between the expressiveness and the analyzability. We saw different approaches for process creation. Uh, we saw how the different models of computation can be mixed. Uh, we saw that uh, Ptolemy and UML are providing a set of such uh, modeling techniques. And we have also seen that in certain cases it may be necessary to combine these different models. We might even use imperative languages in combination uh, with finite state machines and uh, Khan process networks. So this uh, concludes today's lecture and uh, also the discussion of uh, chapter 2. Thank you very much.